Okay, so it looks like we kind of have a quorum here. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. And today, actually, I'm going to present uh, some work I've been doing at LucidWorks, actually more on the ops side um, of actually working with Solar Cloud. So a little bit about me. I won't drone on about this, but uh, actually a lot of the work you're going to see today sort of uh, evolved organically out of a project we're working on um, sort of testing and and um, seeing how solar cloud performs at really large scale, you know, uh, billions, five to six billion documents, uh, 200 plus nodes, that sort of thing. And we're doing a lot of that work actually in the Amazon cloud. Uh, prior to Dotchess Group, I'm sorry, prior to LucidWorks, I worked for Dotchess Group and actually operated a solar cloud cluster and kind of uh, lived it, ate and breathed this stuff for a couple years, um, sort of on the upside as well as as a developer. I also get to work on solar and solar cloud, and uh, uh, sort of happy to announce today I was kind of, um, uh, it was announced that I've become a committer on solar, so that's really awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so onward from there. And then uh, also I'm a, the co-author of Solar in Action. So, okay, so the technology I'm going to present today we're calling the Solar Scaling Toolkit, the Solar Scale Toolkit. Uh, and really what it is, is sort of like when you start out with solar cloud, you know, and there were a couple talks, a couple talks yesterday. Did my mic go off? Oh, I'm too loud? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, great. So one of the things that kind of you'll see when you work with solar cloud is um, the lines between being an engineer, a developer, and actually ops sort of get blurred because now you're dealing with multiple hosts, and once you start dealing with multiple hosts, now you have like, you, you, you know, I, I can't tell you how many little sneaky bashed for loops I've written to do kind of things over SSH, right? And it really becomes pretty uh, evident that you need a framework to help you do a lot of things with Solar Cloud, right? So it's almost like patterns start to emerge, like, oh, geez, I need to be able to do a rolling upgrade of solar cloud in a, in, a, in a particular fashion, that sort of thing. So this toolkit sort of came out of that. Specifically, a co couple of things kind of crop up. One is, well, <clears throat> for now we're using EC2, uh, Amazon. Uh, I'll talk about some, some future plans of this framework down the road to kind of do more on other cloud providers. But right now, uh, Amazon EC2 is what it works on. And so one of the first things there is you have to automate actually provisioning the machines. You want a 10 cloud cluster. Well, of course, you can go in the Amazon console, launch up 10 machines and things like that. But then it becomes apparent that there's also some sort of uh, tasks around uh, mounting disks and all that sort of thing. Uh, other stuff is like configuring and starting ZooKeeper. Not very complicated, but it's also something you want to automate. So uh, this framework handles that for you. The other is sort of bringing up N instances of solar cloud or solar in cloud mode. And it uh, ends up being so you have N nodes and you want maybe, you know, two solars per node. You now have N by N solars to bring up. And you want to get all the JVM start parameters, memory settings, all that sort of thing sort of hashed out and codified in a script. This tool does that. And then there's some other things that I'll sh uh, touch on briefly like Log aggregation. It's great if all my warns and errors and things from my solar cloud go the same place and I can do some analysis and track things down. So I'll actually show you uh, our solution for that as well as, you know, basic monitoring. Like uh, in this case, we're using CollectD to kind of send CPU, CPU load and those sort of things off to a dashboard that we can see, uh, see that over time when we're maybe doing a big end indexing job or whatever. And then lastly, there's a number of day-to-day -day operations. Um, this probably isn't day-to-day, -day, but like, again, I mentioned patching. Um, when uh, uh, Chris, I don't know if you saw his slide yesterday, but, you know, solar is releasing quite often. There's bug releases and there's new feature releases quite often. You want to pull those in. Well, it's good if you can sort of automate the upgrade path, and this thing does that, so... Other things are just like hunting for things in a log or, um, well, I'll get into them sort of uh, as, the, as the talk progresses here. And I'm actually going to do a lot of demoing, so hopefully the network stays up or doesn't get bombarded uh, during the demo here. So the framework itself, 
is Python based, but to use it, you don't really have to know Python. If you want to write more fabric tasks, um, if you don't know Python, it's actually really easy to learn and it's fun and it's pretty easy to set up. So, um, and I'll kind of walk you through some of the basic setup things here, but uh, it's basically made, the core technology is this fr uh, framework called Fabric. And what Fabric does, and you'll see a lot of that in the demo, is actually just kind of makes automating of tasks. It's a framework for building automation scripts, especially over SSH. For now, as I mentioned, we're using a, a Python library called Bodo, uh, which is sort of sits on top of Amazon's web services uh, to interact with S3 and EC2 and all those different web services out there. Um, plans are that actually down the road as my time allows, I want to look at the Apache LibCloud uh, project and, and hopefully port this to that. So we'll see. Um, you know, the good thing is Amazon's a nice environment to start with. And then I use like Pi Solar and uh, actually Kazoo is a misprint there. It's not integrated, but it's intended and that's a Zookeeper library in Python. And then there's some supporting sort of technologies that we're using here as well as like JMeter to run tests and generate reports from those tests, CollectD, uh, Logstash for solar is a solar port. It uses solar as a back end instead of Elasticsearch for Logstash. And then also like JConsole, Visual VM, we'll see how that works in a second. Uh, so Fabric, basically pretty easy to install, really good got documentation, pretty mature project. Uh, you can just go to this link here and I'm sort of showing you the example of, of a um, Fabric task and in this case, it's going to kill all the instances in your cluster, right? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, this framework sort of evolved out of a testing thing. So there might be some tasks in there that you don't want in your production environment. So of course you could take those out, whatnot, or maybe we'll come up with a way to sort of set a prod mode or whatever. But the idea here is just to show it's basic, simple Python code that, uh, that you write to it when you work with Fabric. Okay, all of our commands and everything I'll show you today is actually in this file called a fabfile.py. And to get a list of all the commands, uh, you just do fab-l, and that's gonna actually start giving you some basic overview of the commands that are available. And then if you need more information, so for example here, I wanted uh, to dig in deeper on what's the new solar cloud command do, I do fab-d and then the command. Okay, so uh, the toolkit architecture sort of looks like this. I mean, it's basically Solar Cloud with a couple of uh, extra goodies. So obviously, we have Zookeeper Ensemble. Uh, in production, you really, you don't want to run Zookeeper embedded in Solar or on the same nodes even. So it's typical to have a different hosts for your Zookeeper Ensemble. And the framework, framework helps you set that up. Obviously, Solar, uh, there's some disagreement on whether it's better to run, you know, one solar on one instance or 10 solars. You know, I don't get into those arguments. I've actually always run multiple solars on my server just because I usually have higher end hardware. Um, but it's your, it's your choice. The framework supports either. Um, and then also there's this sort of thing I'm calling the meta node. Uh, and it, it, it's, for right now, it's pretty much, um, intended there to be sort of supporting services. For example, Silk is this project I mentioned that's uh, based on Logstash for Solar that Lucidworks is backing. Is basically, it's Solar integrated with Logstash and Kibana, and it's, uh, it's a really nice tool for sort of a, uh, time series data, and we'll actually see that used today here in the demo. So let me go ahead and dive in. Since this is an ops talk, we'll actually, uh, I think, benefit a lot from just kind of seeing things in action. So in this demo, just to give you an overview, in case I lose you along the way with all the commands flying by, is basically I'm gonna launch this meta node, and that's, um, I'm actually not gonna do that here, just in the uh, sense of time. I'm gonna use the meta node I already have. Um, but basically, it has Silk set up, and you could also put on there the Zabbix server or whatever monitoring server you like, that kind of thing. So the demo would launch a meta node, and then we're gonna launch Zookeeper Ensemble, okay? 
Uh, and uh, so basically, I'm going to launch three nodes so that we have quorum. And then it also sort of sets up a cron job on each one to kind of keep, keep the snapshots cleaned up. If you've done any sort of maintenance with uh, Zookeeper, admin work with Zookeeper, it's one of the things they recommend to do. We'll launch the solar cloud cluster and then uh, create some collections, index some docs. Um, some of the tool sets provided with this, with this toolkit is actually like a health check. You can run a health check on your collection and it'll kind of give you back some stats and things about the, about the collection. Um, I plan to show you the banana dashboard, which is uh, our version of Kibana, uh, and it'll have some of the CPU load and things that came through while we were indexing. And then also lastly, as time allows, um, I'll show backup restore. So basically this toolkit allows you to back up an index onto, um, onto S3 and then restore it. Um, that's, I think, very useful for you know, uh, disaster recovery. You could do it that way, but it's also actually, we use it for backing up like a billion doc index that we don't want to sit and wait for another billion to re-index. So we'll just stash it out in S3 and then bring it back into any old cluster anytime we want, which is a pretty cool thing to have. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. And there's actually work being done right now to actually add backup restore as sort of a built-in feature of solar. So it's not done yet. So this is sort of more of a client uh, side tool that, that I built. So let's uh, fire away here. Okay. So um, I don't like that thing to auto hide except for in uh, in demos. Let's just do that. So I don't have to. Okay. So as I mentioned, I don't want to go ahead and sit through the um, through the uh, the meta node just because again the net network may be slow. But this is actually the command I ran. So I typically forget even my own code how it works. So as you can see me there on top, I do fab dash d new meta node. Right, and give you some basic simple information. Uh, meta node, there's not much to it. You decide, you give it a name. In this case, I called it meta one, and then an instance type. Well, since it's aggregating logs, if you have a lot of systems, you probably want to have a decent size instance there, and it defaults to M3 large. Okay, and so then it goes through this series of steps. First thing is it launches it in EC2. Uh, it sets up block device mapping so that basically um, M3 large probably comes with one ephemeral drive probably 100 gigs or something like that. So it sets up that device mapping so that disk is available to you. Um, been thinking about adding support for EBS, but right now it sort of uh, takes advantage of the instance stores. Okay, so then it um, sort of monitors that progress, and then it verifies SSH connectivity to that host before it kind of calls it good, right? So then... And this is the process of doing any of this work is actually it goes through this kind of monitoring, pulling the API for status, comes back, boom. Now we have a node we can SSH into. So then it goes through a process of actually uh, firing up uh, RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ um, we're actually using behind the scenes because imagine, say you have 100 solars and they're all logging into to Logstash. We actually log into RabbitMQ and then Logstash pulls off uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, sort of makes that a little bit more scalable, and then it deploys the Silk stack, which I'll show you. So that's our meta node. And if I can remember, I'm going to go ahead and keep that meta node around. All right, so now, if I could type. So now I'm going to go ahead and deploy a Zookeeper ensemble. Uh, let me give you some demo that. Again, some basic things there. It says, okay. And what's interesting here is actually this first parameter cluster. And I'm going to call that ZK2 since I already have actually a ZK1 running. Um, and it's telling me it defaults to three instances on M3 mediums, which is cool. So, okay. So it's going to run if you're interested, you can watch that. Uh, but let me talk about this cluster thing, because I think it's actually one of the, I don't know if cool, but more interesting things of the framework is that, again, behind the scenes, you have all these nodes. Uh, could be 10 nodes. They all have these 
you know, EC2 long host names and things like that. Of course, you could set up elastic IPs and that sort of thing. Um, I don't want to fool with that. I don't want to have to like remember. I, you know, I'm used to having an SSH config file a mile long and don't remember any of the names, right? I'm sure you guys can relate. So uh, basically, when you do a lot of things with the framework, you just have to remember this little cluster alias. And then it goes in and uh, sort of queries into the Amazon API and tells me, well, what are the hosts that uh, are associated with this cluster alias? Um, and the, the way it does that is actually with tags. So when we uh, provision a new node in EC2, we tag the cluster ID on there, and then it is a simple filter into the API to say, give me all the hosts, and then we can iterate over those hosts doing whatever. So um, I, I found that, that likes to be super easy instead of having to keep track of hosts or anything like that. I just usually have to keep track of my alias. Okay, so it's, uh, it's moving on. The instances are launched, so that's good. So right now we're verifying SSH connectivity. These are M3 mediums, so we'll see what happens. I have a ZK Ensemble set up right now, so if this doesn't fly, um, usually they're all right, but sometimes M3 mediums kind of flake out, especially I'm in the US East, um, AZ, or um, yeah, AZ, so uh, it's a busy sucker over there. Okay. So while that's running, I'm going to talk about a little bit the next step. We have our meta node. We have our ZK Ensemble building. Um, and by the way, there is a command that you can type. It's demo that will do all this in one big stream. But I wanted to break it down a little bit. Uh, so remember, fab-l will give you all the commands. And there's a, there's a slew of them in here. So let's do fab-d new solar. Cloud, no space. All right, so. So what I want to do now is I want to bring up, let's say, three instances so we don't have to wait too long. And as we can see here, again, I give it a cluster alias. I'll call that demo two since I have a demo one up. Number of nodes. I've already set up a, a ZooKeeper, so I'm going to go ahead and set that parameter. But it also says, well, if you want to just embed ZooKeeper on the same instances, that's cool. Just tell me how many of those. So obviously, ZKN um, needs to be smaller than the number of nodes, or less than or equal to. You can also then say nodes per host. And that's, again, where you decide based on your hardware which uh, instances you're running if you want to have multiple solars per host. You know. Again, I do that, and I think there's a lot of evidence with like Solar Cloud that it's better to have smaller heap sizes. So if you have a node with 64 gig of RAM, you know, it may be better to run two solars with 12 gig max heap instead of 24 max heap on one. So again, I'll let you sort that out with your ops guys, but uh, the, the framework supports it. And then again, I can set up the instance type and whatever. <clears throat> See how Zookeeper, okay. So back to ZooKeeper for a second. This is pretty cool. Fired up the instances after verifying SSH. That's good. Um, you can see it knows all the hosts, but you don't care about the hosts as much. And now it basically you know, went out, configured the MyID file and that sort of thing. And then it ran some health checks on ZooKeeper. Uh, and as you can see, it took a while for, that sort, for ZooKeeper to set, uh, sort itself out, about 17 seconds. It finally realized, all right, successfully created the new Zookeeper Ensemble. So this is working out pretty well. Uh, oops. OK, so now let's build a solar cloud cluster that uses that. So I'm going to call my cluster that I'll remember. Um, somebody give me a name. What is it? Thank you, Haas. Haas is paying attention. All right, so ApacheCon. Um, and then I want three of those bad boys, so N3. And then uh, remember, I've already spun up ZooKeeper, and I named that ZK2. So that's the ensemble I want to use. Uh, again, the framework goes out and figures out what ZK2 is. And then I also do have a meta node, which uh, I don't remember what that's called, but this tool has an awesome little command called fab mine. 
and it shows you all your instances and a little bit of metadata about those, how long they've been running and things like that. So yeah, I do fab mine and I call that meta one. Uh, meta one, okay? And um, the next thing is for me to do instance type and I'm gonna go ahead and do much to the dismay of my boss. <laughs> I'll spend a little extra money here and do m3.larges. They're pretty cheap when you only run them up for a few minutes. Uh, yeah. Wow. That must be a bug. <laughs> okay, so again, since you're provisioning nodes, and some of the other commands don't do this, but they probably should, it kind of prompts you. Um, one of the things a framework I should mention is if like the nodes are already provisioned, it also has all these other commands to like just set up Solar Cloud or just set up Zookeeper. So it's not like if you do something wrong and you have these nodes, you don't have to kill them because you still pay for an hour. Uh, you can just rerun some of the commands, right? So there's kind of there's always the provision and then the actual do some config and setup. Uh, so it's warning me. Cluster is Apache Con. Notice that it figured out the ZK host for ZK2. That looks good. Actually, though, I want to do nodes per host. Let's do two so we get some decent number of solar nodes in there. Per host equals two. That looks good. Okay. And the AMI it's using, um, I should mention that while this, while this runs. Okay, so... There's cloud formation, there's a lot of tools that kind of chef and whatnot that say, okay, let's just build, let's take a bare bones instance and like build up Java and Solar and Zookeeper and all these things on it. We kind of took the approach that um, that's pretty cool, but it doesn't hurt to have Java and Solar and Zookeeper and some supporting services, collect D and whatnot on an AMI and then bring sort of, sort of like it's, kind of a hybrid between bare bones and actually fully baked AMI. And then have that as a public AMI. Um, and then anything you want to do after the AMI sort of comes online, you do it in Fabric Task. So um, I'm still kind of kicking that idea around in my head because for right now, like this public AMI, you'll have access to, we're going to open source this project. I'm, I'll push the button on GitHub after the talk here. Um, so you'll have access to that uh, as a public AMI, um, but it's right now running Red Hat, and so that's one of the issues is like if you're a Debian guy, maybe you want to you wanna do, you know what I mean? So uh, for right now, it's based on a custom AMI. Some of that's legacy. Again, I'm working on a, on a project where we're going to launch up 40 or 50 instances, and big boys too, like I2, 4X larges. Um, I don't want to sit and see Java get installed on 40 instances. And then also the, the goal is not to be only on Amazon, so we didn't want to do cloud formation, that kind of thing, which I know is chef under the scenes, but bottom line is uh, we felt like the, the base AMI is a good start, and then there'll probably be some fab tasks to actually rebuild and bake the AMI if you wanted to change it or whatever. So. All right, so it's progressing nicely here. Uh, remember, we're deploying our solar cloud uh, on three nodes, two solars per node, and all this stuff's swarming by us, sort of like verbose, um, whatnot. As you can see, it, it uh, started collect D. I don't know why it did it twice. <laughs> that, must have been a, that must have been a typo on my part. Um, it's running uh, some bash scripts. So part of, part of how this framework works is actually there's this solar CTL on the node, and I'll SSH into one of the nodes and show you around a little bit in a second, but um, I don't want to do everything in Fabric, and so this bash script kind of does a lot of things like setting, um, setting the proper Java start parameters and that kind of thing. I just didn't want to basically write a bunch of Python strings to, to um, uh, so to speak, build up a bash script and then kind of run that over SSH. So basically, this is part of the framework, the solar CT uh, L.SH, and it has a lot of kind of just things I've learned while working with Solar Cloud kind of baked into that. It also has the ability to kind of, if you say restart, it knows how to go and smartly try to gracefully shut down solar, 
check if it's still up, if it's not, kill it, that kind of stuff. So there's some things that still make sense in my mind to be done uh, in just good old bash script. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're progressing nicely. Uh, four of the six are online. Actually, six of the six are online. Awesome. So let's go check that out. As you can see it here, it's kind of giving you the address of our new cluster. And the readme for the project will give you some tips on kind of how to set up your Amazon environment, because like you're gonna have to have a security group, which I think is your problem. <laughs> It'll tell you, you know, um, obviously security is not something you want probably automated from an open source project. So you're not getting out of that so easy. Okay, so we, again, we haven't done anything with collections or anything yet, but we do have Zookeeper, Solar Cloud Mode, and our happy six live nodes, okay? So that's pretty awesome. <clears throat> and then, okay, let's, uh, let's shut this down. I call that Apache Con, yeah? So what I'm gonna do here is, one thing we found, and you could use Visual VM, or in this case, I'm just gonna bring up JCon, so it's a little, little uh, handy thing there is, um, that bash script sets up all the stuff you need to do to be able to attach like JConsole remotely. Again, probably want to lock that down for production, but for development and testing, it's awesome to be able to attach Visual VM or uh, your kit. Any of those kind of work off this uh, underlying JMX framework in the VM. So now we're attached to the first solar node on our first node in our cluster there uh, and doing some basic monitoring. So let's put that down for now. Okay, let's create a new collection. Solar's not all that interesting with actually <laughs> without an index. ApacheCon. Let's call this collection demo2. We have six nodes, so I'll just kind of do three shards with a replication factor of two. So we'll have one core per node. Okay, again, we're just using the thing. It knows how to go out and kind of request and use the collections API to create that. And I mean, the response isn't all that pretty, but the, uh, the error code you get back if there's a problem is a lot more clear than the actual uh, response. So that looks all good, it's in green. So now we have a collection. Let's uh, reload this guy here. Graph. Okay, there it is. Demo 2, I don't know what that is, that must be Chrome, Chrome uh, Gremlins. Always during a demo, right? Okay, that looks good, so three shards, two nodes, yada yada. Um, okay, so what do I wanna do? Okay, now I wanna do some indexing. Can again, uh, Obviously, you would do this with probably your environment, but this is just a synthetic, create some synthetic docs. Let's do maybe 20,000, um, ApacheCon demo two. There are some commands basically built in here to kind of make this thing demo well. Uh, you know, we'll see how long they live, but um, this is nice. You can go out and index some docs. So we'll do that. And this is using Solar Cloud, so we're not Python right here. We're actually, there's, there's Java code that comes with this toolkit uh, that I'll touch on briefly in a second. But uh, okay, so we're indexing. Um, not much going on on the servers, obviously. Uh, these are very small synthetic docs, uh, but this is the idea. While that runs. So this is where we're paying the network toll, I guess. Would have been nice if I threw a little status in there, huh? <laughs> 5,000 docs so far. There it goes, all right. That's awesome. So what it did here, and obviously the logging's a little 
it said 20,000 docs, sent a final hard commit, and then it ga gathered some basically some health information about each shard um, and looks pretty good there. All the shards agree and their replicas, okay? So uh, that's one of the things in this tool is there's this health check that we wrote with the uh, Java, the solar, SolarJ, the cloud solar server. It has the ability to go into Zookeeper and get metadata out about the, any collection and then we're just kind of using that to, re to report on that. Um, if anybody who's familiar with Solar uh, 4260 was where we we're actually mysteriously losing docs between a leader and a replica, um, this tool like really came in uh, handy in tracking that down actually, this whole framework. So, uh, so that was pretty awesome. Okay, so now we have our collection. Let's verify, learned this yesterday. Boom, okay. So 20,000 docs are in there, everything's looking good. So now what I wanna do is actually run this backup. Did you wanna take a, sorry, let me go back. That one, okay. Hey, this is interactive, this is interactive. Okay, cool. Um, oh, okay, nice. Uh, okay, so let's actually back up to S3. And, um, but before I do that, I'm actually not going to do it on the cluster that I, uh, that I ran because there's a bug in, um, in our friend, the Snap Shooter, that when um, basically behind the scenes, every solar node on these instances actually gets a dedicated disk. Uh, the thinking there is Amazon gives you instant stores with lots of memory that you're paying for, lot, lots of disks, sorry. <laughs> um, so basically solar uses those, right? And the way I've set that up, and maybe it's something I did wrong, bottom line is the, uh, the solar home is like, there's a sim link involved. Okay, and so uh, what ends up happening is there was a bug in that. So what's cool though is the framework allows you to, to do this because this is a very common thing is like, you know, uh, if, if uh, somebody out in the community posts a patch to a feature or whatever and you want to actually patch your cluster, well, you should be able to do that very easily, and you can see I've done that. So basically, there's this fab command, patch jars, and it was the demo, uh, the demo cluster that I set up before my talk, just to fire, verify everything was working. And then I point at demo, and then I point actually to a local, uh, and then in this case is the uh, Lucene Solar 471 tag that I have checked out. I have it built. And then what it does is it goes through these are interesting here. So it uploads the jars to the first host, and then that first host actually knows how to get those jars on all the other hosts. And the idea there is if you have 40 servers, you don't want to SCP from your local box to 40 servers. So that's sort of like a relay server, right? So it does that, and that's why it says other hosts will go faster. So this took probably five minutes, which I'm why I'm not doing it here on this network, uh, to upload those jars. So. <clears throat> Uploaded and then it does a rolling restart and verifies those solar servers come up. Okay, and so that's kind of how the patch process works. And it's very cool. If you have a cluster out there, maybe it's in development or staging, and you know, you get down a patch that you want to test out, see if it works on your data. This tool is like awesome, right? And that's that's like my day every day. Shalin will post the patch. I'll pull it down, try it out, and be like, yeah, that's awesome or whatever. So this this tool is just like uh, pretty awesome. <clears throat> Okay, so then um, in terms of the backup, I'll just actually kind of go through what it did. So um, fab backup to S3, it's the same basic thing, same cluster. Um, it went and did some cleanup in case there was a pre-existing backup. Um, and then it ran this solar cloud tools thing that's part of the framework. Um, and, what, and the reason that needs to be Java, it doesn't have to be Java, but it is Java, is, um, Again, Cloud Solar Server goes out into Zookeeper and gets the topology of your collection. The main thing it needs there is all the shard leaders. 
Okay? So it goes out and does that, and then what it does is it sends this basically this backup command to the snapshot snap shooter, uh, which is the, which is the, you know existing in solar for a long time to support the master slave replication. So that's really the only safe way to back up an index is to actually tell that snap shooter create a snapshot right now of your index and put it in some other directory. Okay, so that all happens on the hosts themselves, right? And this um, tool is here is effectively pulling the replication handler's details to see when it's done doing that. And it's doing that on all, all hosts that have a shard. Okay? So and then once that's done, then it actually just kicks off, and in this case, um, it uses S3 command, which is a little tool uh, for working with, with S3 to go ahead and load those, lo load those uh, indexes up to S3. You could use rsync and put them off to, uh, you know, some NFS store, whatever. You could do uh, EBS mounts, whatever. In this case, we're using S3. That'll obviously have to change once we move to libcloud. Um, okay, so then it, it, it's polling, it's polling, polling, and then realizes, okay, it looks like we're done. So, <laughs> very non-committal of me there. Seems to be done. And uh, then it does some final cleanup, okay? And then, um, and then there's a restore backup, which, which I, I won't uh, go through. But the idea there is go pull those files from S3, bring them back down on the host, and distribute them around the cluster and restore into a new collection. Okay, so let me get back. That's pretty much... Oh, the last thing I want to show is this banana dashboard uh, on the meta node. And the uh, meta node is right here. Okay. And this is kind of sort of you know shameless plug, but also I think it's uh, it's good open source technology, uh, powerful that's um, may or may not be useful to you. Banana. And this is sort of like a pre-cooked little. Um, dashboard. Those aren't the best. Um, that's not the best graph just because I'm only sending the collect D uh, stats over every 20 seconds. But uh, you get the idea. This is basically like a chart of our CP, CPU load over time. <laughs> it really got high there, right? Uh, on those nodes in our cluster, right? So now notice, I didn't go and configure anything. The, fr the framework took care of all that and, and you know, has this built-in default dashboard. So um, memory, those aren't really spiky like that, by the way. That's just um, an issue with the uh, collect D stats being uh, wider than the actual. You know, it's not a purely continuous value there. And then also you have all these different events. Um, these are just basically like, queries into the collect D stats coming over from those nodes. So kind of enables some ad hoc analysis and things like that of, uh, of your data. And then also all the solar nodes are sort of configured to also log in to, to log stash for solar here, uh, warnings and errors. So um, it's not just collect D. You can send any kind of time series data in there, especially logs. Okay, so that was sort of that. And I promise not to be late to go over. Okay. So let me just quickly do a rehash. Okay. So bottom line is when you first start out, we're deploying EC2 instances. Um, again, we use the custom built AMI. That may change over time. Right now, I think it works pretty well, except it's based on Red Hat. It won't be hard to come up with a Debian version because they're not really all that much work on them. It's like it has Java and Solar and Zookeeper and some, some basic services set up. Um, one of the things the framework does do is actually go out and set up the block device mappings correctly uh, because you don't get that with Amazon. Like you get, you get one, but if there's four other disks or three other disks on that instance, you have to set that up yourself. Uh, and then it mounts all those on slash vol zero, slash vol one, et cetera. Um, 
And then uh, again, every instance is tagged with this cluster ID and username. And you saw that when I said fab mine, it, it showed me all my instances, which um, we'll go ahead and really quick nuke those just to show that. So again, fab mine. And then if I, you know, if, if Haas, if I want to see what Haas is doing, of course, this will probably hang, right? <laughs> and it does. All right. So I'll have to check that. That must be an issue. So let's see. Fab mine all. All right. Well, I'm not going to run that because those are apparently slow queries. But anyway, then I can do, I guess this might not be something you want to have enabled in production. But, uh, okay, well, that shouldn't hang, but something's up there. So what that does will actually go out and kill all my nodes that I'm running, which I'll do, hopefully, got them under an hour. Okay, then we saw sort of Zookeeper. There's not much there. Uh, setting up a Zookeeper ensemble, not that big of a deal, except for, you know, you sort of... Um, have the ability now to kind of query and say, Zookeeper, what's your status, yada, yada. Uh, and then also it sets up some cron jobs and what, whatnot. <clears throat> then we saw basically set up a cluster, solar cloud cluster that looks similar to this, basically one or more instances per, per um, machine and then any number of machines, okay? And then ideally, if, uh, if the instance you've, you've uh, selected has the, the instance store disk there, then it'll actually go ahead and take care of the dedicating a disk per solar process, right? And then again, keep in mind, you always want to give a lot of memory the OS cache, okay? Optionally, again, so I, I, I may have said this or not, but the meta node is optional, right? You don't have to fire that up. If you're not interested in that, don't, don't even worry about it. It's there if you need it. If not, uh, just disregard, you just don't pass the meta when you fire the thing up. Okay, and what that does is that will that won't start collect D on your solar nodes, and that won't configure the log4j logger to log into RabbitMQ and that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, so I, I kind of mentioned this. This is again a Bash script that does a lot of kind of on node handy stuff. I'll let you look at that if you pull down the code, and then you know we kind of saw some of this. Um, some of the things I didn't show would be like um, putting and get f getting files to all the nodes. It has all that kind of handy utility stuff built in. Or if you just want to grep all the solar logs for something, because again, the log stash stuff is only logging warnings and more severe. But if you're just looking for an informational message about one of your cores, you can just grep across all the cluster and it'll pull it down. So easy stuff like that, but it's kind of stuff like you always have to write yourself uh, in, a, in a pinch. Uh, and then I covered some of these, you know, um, killing and then, oh, if you want to get into one of the nodes, there's this uh, fab SSH2. And again, that makes it nice that, you do, again, you don't have to remember uh, any host names or have a SSH config file or anything. You just SSH2 Apache com. Boom, I'll take you to the first node. If you want to go to the seventh node, you just do SSH2, PagiCon, N equals seven, right? So pretty simple. And then lastly, uh, we have this uh, Solar Cloud Tools, which is Solar J based client app. And uh, it's two things. One is it already has some tools built in, health check, backup. That'll probably be going away once we actually get back, backup restore into solar. But it's also a framework for you if you're working on Solar Cloud, to build your own tools, right? And hopefully you'll contribute those back at least to this project. And as this matures, it might get pushed into solar or whatnot. But it's, it's a place to kind of build handy things where you will benefit from being able to go into Zookeeper and uh, use the Solar J uh, Cloud Solar Server's ability to get metadata about your cluster in Java. So, <clears throat> And then I kind of talked about Silk, but this is actually what it looks like from an architectural perspective, all the solar nodes optionally get configured with this AMQP log for J appender, which then put these messages to a log. And you know, it's log for J, so you have all that filtering based on level and category and whatnot. Okay. 
And then that gets sent into Logstash for solar, which this is a solar index. And then we saw a little bit of the banana dashboard there. You can do some ad hoc analysis on that kind of stuff. So that's pretty handy uh, for aggregating solar logs. Okay, so a couple minutes and then I'll be done and we'll be ready for lunch. So um, what's next? First is I'm going to open source this. I'll make the uh, GitHub repo public. And then um, I want to start working with LibCloud and actually point, uh, port this to LibCloud instead of just supporting Amazon. Um, but I don't know a lot of the other frameworks. I know Amazon really well. So uh, any help anybody wants to provide on that, like if you're a cloud stack expert or whatever, I will definitely appreciate help. Um, <clears throat> We're going to, you know, like I mentioned, we're using this for some large-scale performance testing. So we're hoping to kind of re report some of the actual results of that back. Um, you know, hey, we ran Solar Cloud in 200 nodes, and 5 billion documents, and this is what we got. Um, I think that's going to be very helpful for the community. Uh, another one that's nice that is not supported yet is Amazon has this idea of spot instances. Um, you basically, they can get yanked away from you if you don't cover the spot price. Um, after your hour, but they're really awesome for testing and firing things up, especially on the more kind of higher end nodes. Uh, so I'd like to add support for that. I don't really know how to do it yet, but I imagine it's not all that involved. And then, again, I think a lot of what Solar Cloud is needing at this point, it's very feature rich. It just, and even Mark mentioned this yesterday, you know, as we're looking for more sort of um, chaos monkey tests that tease out these side cases in, in bigger clusters. Uh, there's um, Jepson. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's sort of, um, it's a project of a guy who really um, rips apart the uh, brochures of uh, NoSQL databases. <laughs> um, and I don't know if the tool is useful for solar, but it might be. So I want to investigate that. Um, so yeah. Basically, it's an open source project. Kick the tires, and you know, let me let us know how it goes if you do play with it, and uh, you know, we'll just take it from there. So, any any questions? I have two minutes. Okay, good. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks.